Hey, John here. Um, I think I've eliminated the easy stuff, right? And we cleaned it all up. We checked all the solder joints, found all kinds of interesting features and some creativity. Uh, nothing that caused this thing to miraculously start working once we've removed five pounds of mud on uh, dust and whatever. Fix some power problems. Some of the slots didn't even have uh, the 12 volt supply and stuff like that. Uh, and it still doesn't work. So, you know, there always comes a point like this where um, you're either done or you have to just accept the fact that you might have to read the documentation. All right, so to get our bearings on what documentation we're looking at here, uh, this is somebody scanned in. Uh, the original user manual that came with the MSI 8080. It looks like that on the cover. Mine is in a three-ring binder. And it is like a card that's sticking in the front of it. It looks just like this, okay? Now, on this manual, which is uh, about 600 pages of scan, at least in this PDF, there's all kinds of stuff in here. And one of the things it has is the uh, control panel uh, theory of operation and some drawings in here and some other stuff a little picture of the thing and so on parts list how to put it together because remember this was originally sold as a kit you know the hideous soldering that we saw earlier while i took this thing apart uh certainly evident of that i would hope that m size own assembly was uh, a little better quality than what we saw when i dug through this now what happens down here in this manual, they start talking about modifications. Well, you know, you need to have a, what? They want to invert this, and uh, what are they going to do? Are they going to run this? What is this for? Make sure the front panel always comes up in stop mode when you uh, boot it up, uh, when you power it up the first time. So, you know, the original design didn't do this sort of thing, and they said, hey, you know, we got extra gates, or there's a spot where you can add a gate, and you can do this, that, and the other thing. And these came out as recommended upgrades over the years, and here's another one where they say, you know, cut a trace, do this, do that, and then, and then they say, oh, update your, your drawings accordingly, and so on. I'm not going to look at that, okay? Someone a couple of years ago went through the tedious process of, of writing a modern version of the schematic with the standard modifications already all applied so we can read it without going through all that tedious process, okay? And they include a little note down here in the title block that says this is not the original schematic and he doesn't want to, you know, rain on anybody's parade and we should actually go out and get the original ones if you're really into this and I strongly recommend you get your own copy. But, you know, this one has been provided, you know, in the spirit of the home hackers and the maintainers and so on, okay, for the community, all right? And this is a pretty good schematic. In fact, if you look at any other videos on YouTube and they're talking about the 8080, almost always they're using this exact drawing, okay? Why? Because it's much cleaner than the hand-drawn and corrected scanned-in paper copies that are the only original ones, as far as I know, that uh, have been floating around, okay? Now, uh, I'm not going to go over this whole thing. Let's do a quick bird's eye view here and sanity check what the heck is going on. What you've got up here in the upper left, uh, these boxes with the red line around it represents the pins on the S100 bus. So pin number 70 on the giant connector is the processor right signal, and it comes into the front panel, goes through some gates, and is used accordingly, all right? And so on. What you have over here is um, the... Circuits that, that these are debouncing timers for the most part that are uh, there to deal with the mechanical switches for, you know, you get your single step switch. That's this one here. The deposit and the deposit next switch is here. The examine uh, and examine next switch is here. Okay. Uh, there's a run signal that comes out of, uh, where's the run? Oh, that's single step up there somewhere. There's a run switch. Uh, right down here, the run and stop switch here, okay? Now, these thingies here, you, I'll leave it as a test of viewer. It's a 74-123. Grab the data sheet and look and see what it says. You know, how do these work? The short of it is when A is low and B is high, this thing is triggered to generate a pulse on Q that is a positive going edge followed by uh, a duration of some period of time determined by this RC network right here, and then it goes back low again. All right. 
At the same time, they give you Q bar. So if you want a positive pulse, you use Q. If you want a negative going pulse, you use Q bar. And they cleverly use both in a lot of these situations. Sometimes they only want a lower going pulse. And this, the neat thing about this drawing is the uh, the person that, that created it annotates it a little bit and draws up here. Oh, by the way, this thing is going to generate a 1.8 millisecond pulse coming out of Q bar. And he reminds you that it looks like this when this switch gets triggered and or when this circuit it gets triggered right and they go along and, and note all of these okay so there's what about four or five of these a couple of jk flip-flops that are used uh to deal with the state machine that is required for deposit next and examine next i mean that you think about what does that really mean well i have to go to the next one whatever that means we'll talk about that in a minute and then i have to uh, deposit something in the memory so there's a there's a, a more than one cycle involved in that, right? So there are counters that go through these processes that says every time I click, you know, like examine or examine next, it has to go through this plurality of cycles. And those flip-flops up here and these two down here generate a counter that goes through four states. That's what this is discussing here, uh, that it is using to get an address onto the bus and then get the data onto the bus and write and store things into the memory, you know, accordingly, all right? So that's what's going on in this part of the schematic over here. And on my front panel, it would appear that all this stuff is working fine. So... Uh, I'm probably going to be a big mistake, but I'm going to generally ignore all this other than to observe that's what it's here for. <laughs> that's what this part of the schematic does. Okay. Part down there has to deal with the running and the stopping and the stopping doesn't work very good for me. Okay. Now look at what we see in the bottom left corner of this drawing. Pin number 35 in the S100 bus is the data output surprise number five. Once again, this data bit number five all of a sudden shoves in our face. What does that do? It, 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 they note that this is the M1 status bit, or more accurately, it is derived from the data that comes out of data output number five and it goes into some gates here. And what have we got? Some pull-ups. If I click down to stop, what I'm doing is I'm grounding pin eight, which goes low. That's uh what is this? Uh, it's a demorganized version of a uh, gate here. So when uh, phase two is low and the stop button is pressed at the same time and this is going at two megahertz so it's going to definitely happen you're not going to be able to click this and release it and miss that uh, then this thing will go true and when this is true and this is true at the same time and this p-sync whatever that is it turns out that's like a signal that goes true at the beginning of a bus cycle then this thing will go low because this is a NAND, right? There's a bubble there. And it says stop CPU on the M1 cycle. So surprise, our M1 status bit is apparently related to the data bit number five. I alluded to that earlier in the in this series, and I said, spoiler alert, <laughs> these are related. So the fact that M, the, the data bit number five LED doesn't work should uh, mm, throw, <laughs> throw a little light on there, guess what? <laughs> it's also involved in this in a not-so-obvious way until you start looking at the schematic here, okay? This latch here, the JK flip-flop, is used to remember if I'm supposed to be running or not running and so on. There's the LED that goes on when it's running versus not running. And uh, the run signal uh, obviously goes to the run output on the S100 bus, which tells the CPU it can go and so on. Now, the S100 bus has some signals that seem kind of uh, redundant-ish. And if you put a low on X ready, it will stop the CPU. Then why in the world does it have a run and an X ready? It also has like a P ready. There's a couple of different things, okay, that have to do with stopping the CPU and creating wait states and things like that. And I'm going to leave it with, depending on the reason you want to stop the CPU and what you want to stop the CPU from doing, you might need to use a different one of these control signals. All right. 
Uh, X ready is the uh, weight state generator. Like if you're looking at a Z80 and it says, hey, I want to read from memory now, or I want to store this in a memory. That's the signal that you can assert to extend that bus cycle. All right. And this is the, the signal that is the thing that really does stop the 8080 in the IMSI 8080 uh, machine. All right. So this is what's really ultimately going to hold the CPU at bay when we are examining and depositing or just simply paused in in stopped mode okay all right uh and of course you can see that comes from something that is dependent on the m1 status on on data bit number five uh what else is going on down here all these leds are the address uh leds these are all the address bits you can see them they connected to a0 through a15 on the s100 bus this nand gate here takes as inputs the entire most significant uh eight bits of the address bus which it uses to determine the io port address and it asserts this signal is true which is low so that the card knows when I read or write from port FF, as we, I showed this earlier in another video on my channel, that is the uh, signal, uh, that's the port, that if I read from it, I can input uh, the value that's currently on the uh, most significant byte of the eight switches on the front panel of the CPA. I can also do an output operation, and I can store a value in the eight LEDs that are also on the front panel as an output operation. If we just take a moment and look at where this track goes, okay? It goes up and around into a gate in here along with something else, and it winds around to this thing over here, which goes to the strobe input, which is the <laughs> enable bit, you know, of an 8212, which is an 8-bit latch, and this is where those 8-bit LEDs are. It says, hey, so here's the value that somebody outputted to port number FF, okay? So we can start to see kind of how these things are coming together. The clear input here probably comes down and around and goes to the reset signal, which is, uh, you yeah, the power on clear, which is going to be your, one of your reset inputs. So when you first turn on the power of your uh, machine, that's why uh, these things all turn on, and they're all on by default when you first power up the uh, device. PWR means processor write, so this means that the address has been selected, and this here means that the uh, processor is doing a write operation right now and wanting to output the data. So these are basically, uh, it's like an, again, another enable type input here, okay? Uh, so that makes sense. You know, we'd expect to see something like that. And let's zoom out a little bit here. Uh, there's a bunch of gates in here. Well, I'll talk about what these do in a minute uh, because you need to kind of understand what's going on over here before you look at this. Uh, the stuff here in the middle has to do with controlling how you um, examine and examine next and deposit and deposit next. These uh, The inputs of these, as you can see, wind over here, and I go to these uh, latches that are the counters that make up a state machine that have to do with depositing and examining and, and stuff like that, all right? So let's look and see what this is right here. My suspicion is that this is where our entire problem is with my front panel. Everything else on here I'm going to assume is okay, and you'll see why in a minute. What this is, this socket right here is the socket that holds the ribbon cable that floats up and out of the front panel and reaches over and plugs into the CPU card. And on that ribbon cable, there are eight bits, eight signals. These are uh, data bits uh, zero through seven, okay? And for some reason here, they decided to number them one through eight. So half the places in the schematic, they're labeled one through eight. Other times they're zero through seven, makes it a giant pain in the butt. So sometimes we're looking at data bit number six. Other times we're looking at data bit number five. Keep your mind on the goal and always check to see if some dingus started it with one or whatever okay turns out in this particular case <laughs> these are the actual pin numbers on the uh on the uh um insulation displace connector header 
plug on the end of the cable, all right? So it just so happens that pin one has data bit zero and so on. So uh, again, I, I, another reason that they went and numbered them in a weird way that drive me nuts, okay? Uh, okay, so what do we got here? You've got these eight data lines, and among other things, they wind in, down, and around to a bunch of drivers that light up these LEDs. These are our eight LEDs that light up for data bit zero through uh, a seven. They, they do label them that way right here, so you can see which is which and what's what, right? So uh, if data bit zero is a one, goes through this LSO4, becomes a zero here. Whenever this is a zero, this LED will go on, right? So these eight LEDs tell us the current value on these eight data lines right here, okay? These eight data lines include the one data bit right here, data bit five, that doesn't work, all right? This is our problem right in here, all right? So someone, is preventing this signal from ever going high, okay? Because maybe it's not connected to something that needs to pull it up, or it's connected to something else that's pulling it down and never letting it go. So let's look and see what it's connected to. Now, let's take a pause here before we do that. And think for a second, we have seen the data bit five light go on. When I first turn this thing on and it, we just click examine next, 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 and look at the garbage that's in memory, the random junk in there. Sometimes this light is on. Sometimes it's not on. That's one of our clues, okay? The fact that this LED does actually go on from time to time means it's not a dead LED. This resistor did not open. This gate works. Probably, right? Because it's sometimes it's on, sometimes it's not, right? I'm pretty sure this is okay. What's this thing over here? These are 7405s. These are open collector drivers. If this gate here has a one on it over here, it will pull this signal to ground. If this gate has a zero on it, the output of this gate is floating. It doesn't drive it high. It lets it float. And that's critical to understand what the heck is going on with these thingies over here. Every one of these inverters over here are open collector driver 7405s. Okay? What does that mean? That means that this gate can pull this thing to ground, but it cannot and never will ever pull it high. This gate can do that on D5. If this gate is told one over here and it's always one, that will pull this thing to ground and leave it there. Okay? So this is one of the possible things that could go wrong. Maybe this signal over here is broken. But as you can see in the schematic, if this signal here is broken, then every one of these should be driving low at the same time. So... Uh, this signal is probably not our problem. Plus, we can put a probe on it and have a look-see at it. And, you know, why? Because they'd all go low. The only way that wouldn't happen is if every gate in this set of gates was broken, and this is the only one that's working, and this signal is not what it's supposed to be. That's an awful lot of ifs, okay? Generally, that's not the case. Uh, it could be. Like, for example, if every one of these was on U4 and then this one here was on U5, it might be the whole chip is dead. That is a more likely situation, okay? But as you can see, U1, 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 all three of these are on one chip. U3 is here. All three of these are on a different physical chip. And these are on U4, which is a third physical chip, okay? And D5 is our only signal that is problematic. So if it's caused by a problem in here, then the problem is most likely be that this one gate has failed inside a chip that is otherwise working. If that's even our problem at all, okay? What about this down here? These are all inputs. This latch has eight inputs and it has eight outputs. So it's not like this thing could have accidentally started outputting something on 
the data bit bit number five and 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 and, and do and it does that and then sometimes it does not do it because remember sometimes this LED does in fact go on. Okay. So this line is almost always low, but sometimes goes high. And that that's weird, okay? Could it be this? I, I see. If the silicon has failed inside here, then yeah, something weird could happen. What about these over here, right? Well, look at the way these switches work here, okay? If I flip this switch up, it opens it the way this is designed, okay? It doesn't say this in the drawing, but it, that's what... That's what it means, all right? So if I actually reach over to the front panel and flip every one of these switches up, all 16 of them, even if there is a problem with these drivers over here, and I haven't even gone into what they do yet, who cares? These switches are physically disconnecting them from this bus. So this is a test we should do. Does it still screw up if every switch is up? <laughs> if it does, then this is not our problem. Or if it is a problem, it's one of two problems. There must be another problem, okay? There's some more drivers up here that are hooked up the exact same way that these are down here. And they're hooked up the same way these here would be connected if all these sw switches were down, okay? But if all these switches are up, the only thing that's ever driving any data onto this bus, assuming that all these chips are generally functioning correctly, are these up here, and they're also 7405, so they're open collector, which means they can either pull the bus down or let it float, just like these down here. Pull it down or let it float. These are all connected to inputs. Generally speaking, there shouldn't be a problem with the inputs on these gates. There could be a problem. I don't know. Anything that happened once the silicon has failed. These down here are all inputs. In theory, there could be a problem. I don't know. All right, well, what do we know? The only things that are physically connected to these lines, if these switches are up, are these gates, these gates, these gates, and this latch, and then whatever's on the other end of that cable. All right, so let's do a quick test to see if any of these switches change anything, because if it does, then uh, we know where to look. All right, so here's the state of the uh, system right now. I've got the memory card plugged in back here. This is going to appear in the bottom 8K of the memory address space. The CPU is plugged in. Ribbon cable runs over here to the front panel. And, of course, the front panel is attached and plugged in as well. All right, so let's power it up. So I haven't touched anything at all. We come right out of power up. And what is the state of this thing? We've got some of the status lights on. This, remember, is the data bits, D765, our culprit here, 4, 3, 2, 1, and 0. And these are the address lines, the address bus here, all zeros here. And the M1 bit is the uh, status uh, LED is right over here. Now let's review the clues that we know right now so we can figure out what the heck is really going on with this thing. We just powered it up. And if you think about what's really going on here, uh, the uh, system is in the stopped mode. And when it's in the stopped mode, what it's really doing is it's in an ex infinitely long wait state while the CPU is fetching an opcode. We don't know that because M1 is not lit over here, but we saw it on the working MSI 8080, but that was in fact the case. Now if we click this and go into a reset, what should happen is every one of these LEDs over here should be on, and these are going to be off, okay? Now let's look at the reset for a minute here. I didn't uh, take a look at this earlier in the drawing. How do all the LEDs go on, or at least all the LEDs other than the four right side status bits, how do they all go on when you hit reset, okay? So w w what is this circuit really doing over here, all right? So if you click the reset switch one way, you assert this reset signal on the S100 bus, and there's a note over here that says, oh, by the way, if you assert the P reset here, the CPU board will, in return, assert the POC. We saw the POC earlier. It's up here. It comes down here and is involved in the timing and control of this flip-flop here that determines if and when we can uh, assert the run signal or not, okay? Now, what's going on with external clear here, all right? In this diode here, CR1, 
What this means is if I assert reset, the diode allows me uh, the uh, the low voltage here, the ground also flows through the diode and will assert external clear at the same time. Okay, so if you hit reset, you're really doing reset and EXT clear. If you click it the other way, you just assert EXT clear. All right, now EXT clear, the intention for that is to be able to reset boards without really resetting the whole CPU and everything. When you hit P reset, you're resetting everything, including whatever EXT clear does. All right, so there's the mindset on that. And this is all there is to the reset signal, and there is no more. So how in the world does the reset signal cause all these address lines to go? How does it turn on all these LEDs, okay? And even uh, the uh, these LEDs here and the data LEDs and stuff on there. Well, these ones I already talked about. If POC ever is asserted, it resets this latch and these all come on. We just said reset will indirectly uh, assert POC. So that takes care of these. It turns out if we look at the CPU board, which is what generates all these other signals for the, LED, the address lines and all these control and status bits, uh, these things will all be asserted as well when we hit this uh, reset signal. So let's look at the schematic of the CPU board. Here's the reset signal coming in off the S100 bus. It's got a pull up on it. It does nothing else other than reset this 8224 chip, which is a custom designed support chip to go along with the 8080 CPU. All right, these days, all this is combined together, right? But what does this chip really do? You've got your reset and our friends, the ready and external, or X ready over here. You can see that P ready and X ready, uh, because this is an and uh, function here with these two gates, implements one uh, and gate. If either of these is low, this is low. Okay, if either one, if both of them are high, then this thing here is high. So what those do is uh, cause the CPU to stop running. It stops the current uh, machine cycle. So this chip here, as you can see, is the crystal oscillator in here. It takes in the reset as a reset out. It has the TTL clock that comes out here, the phase one, two clock, and a signal called ready over here. All this stuff has to do with um, generating the bus cycles and uh, running the main system clock for the CPU, okay? So if you assert either one of these, it stops. These uh, signals are frozen, which is what stops the 8080 from running. If you assert the reset signal here, it does whatever is necessary to reset uh, this chip as well as the CPU by way of this ready line and the reset and sync lines here. You can see it comes out and goes to the 8080 over here. Now we know what else. The reset signal that's sent to the CPU also gets inverted and run over to the power on clear signal there. That's where that comes from. This also reaches up and around here and goes along with status strobe over to the control inputs on this 8212. We saw an 8212 before when it came to the eight LEDs on the front panel which is over here. Now these things have different modes and things like that. It's an eight bit latch that's kind of configurable. Uh, point is uh, we saw what happened over here and when we cleared it, all these LEDs went on and these LEDs are tied to five volts. So in order for these to go on, the outputs all had to be zeros over here, okay? Now the 8212 on the CPU drives these uh, eight lines here and we see all these LEDs here go on when we're reset, okay? And notice these ones though are connected to ground. So in order to light these LEDs up, they have to be all be set to ones. So if we were to clear this 8212 and these all became zeros and we go through these drivers, which are usually on because there's nothing in our system that will assert the status disable line and therefore it's pulled up, which goes through this inverter, which makes it low, which upsets me, the 1897B, which these are gates, this is what these chips are, have the input called disable rather than calling it enable and therefore these should all, in my opinion, have bubbles on them and they should be the control signal should be called enable instead of having all this negative logic confusing the crap out of me personally it's it's a it's a conspiracy against me personally i'm sure that's the case <laughs> anyway uh these things are all on so the only way all those leds could light up 
would be if somehow all these were set to ones. So if you rummage through the doc for the 8212, we find this diagram here, and here's the clear. Now notice the clear is gated. Clear is active low, and this thing here also has to be low in order for the clear to take place, in order to set all the output bits here to low, which we know is not happening. We know they all became set to a one. So what's this other signal here? If we go up here, blah, 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 it comes out of this OR gate, which is driven by all these gates here. And we know on the CPU strobe, MD and DS2 are all pulled high. Therefore, this gate can never go true, because that's a 1. That's a high, and this comes from here. This will go high when DS2, which is always high, is 1, and DS1 is low. So when we're resetting, if DS1 happens to go low, and this is a 1, this becomes 1, which clocks the latch and disables our ability to clear the latch, which is really intuitive, guys. Thank you very much. Uh, but uh, in the, you know, their defense, they, you know, they put a lot more thought into this than I did. Uh, this is, you know, for multiple purposes and stuff like that. So uh, we're clearing it, and I suspect we're also clocking it at the same time. I don't know if this is a transparent latch or an edge-triggered latch. What does it say here? Now, I'm pretty sure, in spite of a lot of what's going on in here, if you, if you read this whole doc, uh, it never really comes right out flat and says it. However, these gates down here, these latches down here, I'm pretty sure are level uh, triggered, you know, transparent latches. So if C is high, D is reflected over to Q. Because uh, if you go to the very last page of this uh, beautifully scanned document, uh, you you will find that it talks about a gated buffer. Simplest use is as a gated buffer by tying the mode signal low and the strobe input to high, then it'll be a straight through gate, which is another way of saying a transparent latch. Output buffers are enabled by doing this. Device selection is false. The outputs go into tri-state. Tri when it's true, the device selection is true. The input data from the system is directly transferred to the output. Uh, if you meant to say it's transparent, why don't you just say so, people? And, of course, the way they've stated that in there suggests that this has to be low or something. Look, <laughs> no matter what they talk about these things, you have the circuit here. And because it is a uh, 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 transparent latch when it's in some weird described mode. The only way these things can work and provide all that is if this is in fact active high. So if the DS1 is low, DS2 is high, MD high, strobe is high, then we know for an absolute fact that this signal here must be one and this must be one and that must be one and C must be high, which disables the clear input. And the enable here is always high because of what comes out over there. Therefore, when we are in a reset state, if clear is low and the DS1 is also low, and we could probe this to find out. I'll bet anything these are both low at the same time. Uh, therefore, this goes into becoming a transparent latch and driving this from the pull-up resistors on the data bus, right? Now, we can fire it up and put a scope on there real quick to see what happens when I'm holding down reset. I'm real sure we're going to find both of these are low uh, for the duration of holding down the reset key. And that, in the end, is why all these things look uh, uh, light up when we hit the reset, except for the M1, of course, because I, as I said before, I think that the uh, pull-up resistor on the line for the M1 signal is uh, not pulling due to somebody pull, uh, slamming it down. So I got a probe clipped onto pin 14 on the 8212 on the CPU board. Here's my scope. I assert reset up, it goes down and stays down. I release the button, it goes high and stays high. So we know that clear goes on and stays on as long as I hold the switch on. 
Oh, moving the scope probe over to pin one on the 8212, and I press the reset pin uh, switch on. It goes low, stays low. Release it, it goes high, stays high. And that gives us our confirm as to why the status uh, signals on the 8212 from the CPU all go high and stay high during reset. So why then are the address lines lit up? Well, the address bus also is floating during reset on the 8080 as well. And these drivers are all on because there's nothing disabling them and there's no pull-ups, but if they're floating and these have TTL compatible inputs, then it'll assume they're ones and drive all these high, which is kind of screwy for them to have done this. But so be it. That's how that's happening. Again, remember all the LEDs for the address lines are pull are uh, driven uh, on one side to ground. So in order to light it, these all have to have been set to a one, which leaves us with the interrupt, enable, hold, acknowledge, and P weight, which come from here. Interrupt, acknowledge. Where is that thing? P weight. Oh, these are the S100 bus names. Uh, hold a interrupt, enable, and P weight are directly off the CPU here. So we'd have to look these up to see what they do. Which brings us back to our, uh, our, our reset timing diagram here and the generic statement that status information is all high. Uh, they got to be more explicit, people. <laughs> I'm going to die of laughter here trying to figure this out. Um, we're going to have to go with some empirical evidence. I'm not going to read all 100 pages of this thing right now. What we do know is that uh, the LEDs do go on. The IMSI 8080 manual says it's supposed to go on. Therefore, there's overwhelming circumstantial evidence that these are supposed to all go high. And that's why these are driven high by these drivers over here. So that's why all these LEDs end up high. That's why these LEDs end up high here, because it's reset. These are all high because during reset, the data bus is floating and pulled up on the CPU card. So resetting here shows the 50 m 10 If we go to examine now, what we're really doing is we're looking at the byte from the memory card at this address down here. We're already looking at the byte value that's at uh, address zero right now. And we can confirm that by just clicking examine. It's going to put on what's already there. Now, if we go to examine next, what we're going to do is we're going to go to the next address. You can see it just added one to the address. Then it's going to show us the byte that's in memory at this new address. What was the D5 one on? So what the heck is up with that? Right? Obviously, it can go on. Apparently, right, it can go on if there's a bit in memory that has a 1 in this position. Well, let's assume, all right, not a good idea, but uh, the clue here is that if I'm examining and examining next that I'm wandering through data that's in the memory that happens to be just garbage that's in there when I power the system on, sometimes this bit can go on, all right? So it's not entirely dead. We still don't have M1 over there. But at least we can see that that LED will, in fact, go on. Now, uh, what's the clue there, right? Well, that means that the driver for M5, or D5, I should say, that's in the front panel here, one of these chips down here, uh, is working, provided that it actually gets a 1 in this ribbon cable so that it <laughs> says to turn that LED on, right? Okay, so next clue. Let's turn up all the address lines. Maybe one of these switches is bad or something like that. Uh, or more accurately, one of the uh, open collector drivers that's connected to the switches, when these are down, is stuck, right? So if I examine from this address, we get another clue here. Hmm. <laughs> this one's off. That one's off. And now we have all the LEDs on. Now, make sure that we interpret this thing correctly. If I examine... The value of a byte that comes from a memory card that is not in this system. Remember, our memory card is only the bottom 8K. This is address FFFF in hex. All right, so we read from a non-existent memory address, or more accurately, from a non-existent card on the backplane. 
nothing sent any data, and we got all ones, all right? Now, uh, TTL gates, if the input is left floating or pulled up, will be high, okay? So uh, these are weird, all right? Again, it's uh, data bit number five, all right? But we can uh, look around and see why this is so. Uh, in the schematic, we can see that there is a relationship in here, right? We Actually, we already sort of know it, right? Remember all these eight switches and all these eight switches? These are just connected up to the data bus through their various open collector drivers anyway. So it doesn't, it shouldn't be a shock yet to, to notice that D5 is the same uh, physical wire that also expresses the, um, the values of these uh, bits here, uh, indirectly, as we'll see. Now, I did an examine on address, you know, FFFF, and this is what I got. If I hit next, what it should do is add one to this address, which would, if it is all ones, this whole address should turn around and become zero, right? So this would let us know if the address bus really is all ones or not. Is this value here the address bus? Or is it FFFF, okay? So if I hit examine next, it should add one to it. If this is the address as is shown here, I should add one to this value. Zero with a carry, zero with a carry, zero with a carry, zero with a carry, zero with a carry. The carry should turn this on and the other bits over there should not be changed. On the other hand, if it really is FFFF and there's something wrong with the display and I add one to it, it should the whole thing should go to zero, right? Because all ones plus one is zero with a carry, blah, 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 blah. Uh, overflow off the other end and we'd end up with zero. So I hit this, and lo and behold, when I added one to what was shown, the value was as shown. Okay, so whatever it is that's adding one and doing this advancing here is working based on the data that's on these LEDs. So that's another one of our clues. These get a little bent. I gotta make sure I don't bend them too much and break them off before I put the front back on here. Now, if I keep clicking these, we can do the same test again, right? Now what's going to happen, right? Is that thing really zero or a one? Same logic will apply. If this really is a zero, and I'm pretty sure it is because we saw that was the case with this one, should be a similar kind of a problem. We should see a carry go all the way over to here, turn that LED on, and all these should be zero once I hit examine next here, which is the case, okay? And it continues on. And of course, because none of these addresses, due to the fact that these two bits here are ones, none of them are mapped into our memory card Every time I read any value, it's coming from a high impedance bus. Okay, so again, we always see uh, all these data bits all set to ones here. All right, let's go back to looking at the data that's in our memory card here. Okay, as we saw a minute ago, if I click through here, I'm reading garbage that happens to be in the memory. Okay. Let's go ahead and just deposit a bunch of zeros in here. Now, we've done this a number of times. You can actually sort of see it flash as it goes through and stores the zero in there. What we're really doing here is we're seeing the old value get replaced real quick as we go through deposit and deposit next like this. So if we go back and examine them all, we notice I made the same mistake I made in an earlier video. I forgot to hit deposit to get the very first byte, right? All I did was deposit next in there. But, uh, okay, so now we see that I have all zeros stored in a memory, and it does show me what I've stored in there within reason. If I store this value into address zero, it will, well, almost go in there, right? I should say, if I store this value, or even this one, okay? It does get it stored into the memory, but if I try to set this one to a one, it won't do it. Okay, so that is another clue there that we can run with, right? I can't seem to store a one bit in this position into the memory, but, and I'm only assuming here, okay, but I believe that if there's garbage in the memory and we happen to just be wandering through it like this and there happens to be a one in that bit position, that it will go on on this display, okay? Now let's go ahead and put a bunch of no-ops in the memory here for another clue here, all right? These are just a bunch of no-ops, okay? Go back to here. I can even do a reset. 
We've got a zero on the address bus. If I single step, and we saw this like two videos ago, it does want to execute what's there. Now, I'm only executing no ops here. I don't have my M1. The M1 I've never seen turn on on this thing, ever. But it does seem to be executing all those no ops. Now, I don't know what this is. But if it does execute it, uh, <laughs> it'll go somewhere. Look at this. Uh, it went to address F, 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 what have we got? 8, 9, A, B, C, D, right? So it went to address F, D, somehow. Uh, notice also that this light and this light came back on it. We executed uh, essentially a, <laughs> a jump address, a jump instruction that ends up going in here. Now, it's not actually a jump instruction, is it? This light came on. That is the stack light which indicates that we're doing a stack operation right now. I suspect what it's really doing is writing into the stack a return address from a restart instruction. Because it turns out I'm pretty sure that the garbage value that was in there is like a restart, a restart instruction of some kind. So what it's really doing is storing something into the stack. If I single step again, I suspect it's, this is part of the address which ends in a zero. And then it'll be another part of the address which looks like a 1F so what it's doing is telling, uh, it's throwing in the stack where to come back to if I return from a restart instruction. The next time I click this, that should go off, and we should be reading a, um, a machine cycle uh, number one from a byte in memory in uh, whatever that restart address would have been from, like, I don't know, 28 or 30 or something like that. So the next instruction should be the execution of the restart handler. This address is a 1.8 in hex and it's got a null, okay? A zero, a no op, right? So what happens now? We got this guy here and the one over there. And this one here means memory read and this one here means that it is not writing right now. It's weird that they made that a not signal, but that's actually what it is in the bus, so I suppose it makes sense because that is the, the, the way that it is on the bus, it's negated like that. But I would rather have them be positive logic. You know, 45 years later, <laughs> it makes more sense to me to use positive logic everywhere. But the fact that it was not on when we saw the stack light on meant it was writing into the stack, okay? So now we're reading from memory. We're, uh, presumably the M1 bit here should be on, but it's not. And we should be executing no ops again until we run into another garbage instruction like this where it's going to do the same thing and uh, end up with a reset instruction. What is this thing? 8, 9, A, B, C, D, F. So we look up the opcode D, F. We should see that that would be like restart uh, 1, 8. Okay? Or the restart instruction that ends up going to address 1, 8. And we see the same thing we saw a minute ago. There's the stack light, and we are further uh, in memory than we were before. Is that true? There's the address that should go one less and store the other half of the uh, return address. Then go back to executing at the restart address. Go through memory, do this again. We should see the stack continuously decrementing. And when we do, we do actually. We go around and around and around. We can see the stack uh, pointer decreasing its value every single time we do this. So this isn't a spin loop of destroying the data that's in the stack. It's actually writing it into a memory card that doesn't exist, of course, because it's writing it way up here in high memory where there is no card. But we can see it all running. We can see uh, another clue here, of course. As this happens, what it's doing is showing us that the CPU is... Well, with the data in here on these LEDs, when we see these stack writing, okay... That data is coming from the CPU itself. So let's go around one more time and double check this, all right? Because I think we got another clue here. Uh, we're not writing, we're doing a memory read. And this again is the restart instruction. And the next two operations are gonna be writing into the stack, okay? So here's what's happening. When I'm writing into the stack at this address, the data on these LEDs right now is coming from the CPU. It is not coming from a memory card. 
or you know a card that's writing it onto the S100 bus to the CPU. This is from the CPU. So this is the first time I think we're seeing that play out here. So there's one byte, and here's the other byte of the 16-bit uh, address that the CPU has written into the stack. And this would be the address of uh, where to return to from after the, uh, uh, or more accurately, this is the address, the um, low uh, byte, least significant byte of the address of the opcode following the restart instruction that caused it to go through this song and dance here to execute the restart, okay? So then we go to the restart handler and we're back to this again. Now, uh, in contrast to what was happening during the pushing operations into the stack, we're now seeing data read from the memory card as opposed to data that's being read from the CPU. So what we know or what I believe here is that we can see data right now from the memory card, and we can see data from the CPU, which is two different data directions while we are running our little test program here. So let's verify the return address comes out right, okay? So see the address of this thing here? What do we got? A 1E in hex, because this bit here is a zero. Uh, it should return to 1F, or that should be the return address it pushes into the stack. And that is, I believe, what we saw in there. So when we see it pushing into the stack, we got a, a 001F. So all this jives. We're in a spin loop executing a restart instruction of some kind, which happens to be garbage that was stored in memory, or maybe I stored this in while clowning around by accident. But this gives us a lot of clues. Well, let's run with these clues, walk through the schematic, look at see how the CPU and this cable here communicates with the front panel to see if we can figure out uh, what the heck is going on. All right, so what do we know here? Uh, we know that these switches here are used with the address bus, and it also turns out that the uh, these switches here do a double duty, as it notes over here. There's the low uh, bits of the address, as well as the data input uh, values uh, come off of these switches right here, okay? So um, this kind of does a double set of duty. This is the address lines. And it is also something that uh, you can read if you do an input from port FF, which it notes over here, okay? So these are all doing multiple duty here, and they're all connected to this miracle cable that runs over to the CPU. Uh, let's zoom out for a minute here. Uh, what, what do we also know? We know that, that these switches and these wires in no way are connected to the LEDs over here, which are physically connected directly to the S100's address bus. So somehow, when we toggle an address in on these switches over here and we click the examine switch, Somehow, most of them <laughs> have their information transferred over to these LEDs. Somehow, okay? This is a rather clever, uh, 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 what, uh, a clever uh, uh, implementation scheme of how this thing really works, all right? Now, they're not the ones that came up with it. This is the exact same way that the MITS LTER worked before the 8080 came out, which is almost entirely a clone of the LTER system. Uh, I don't know where the design for the LTER came from. In other words, I don't know who came up with this original plan the first time, all right? I don't know if that's a MITS thing or if this was generally known before even MITS used it. I don't know. I I'd love to hear uh, if you got uh, any, any insight on that in the comments below the video. Please uh, do post. All right, so somehow, miraculously, uh, these switches get fed into the CPU card and then they affect the address lines over here. And some of them don't work. Now let's look at the schematic uh, of the CPU card here. Bird's eye view. This here is the CPU itself. These uh, pins down here are the address lines that come out of the CPU that directly drive the S100 bus right here, okay? There's nothing else connected to them uh, in this, uh, on this board. So somehow, <laughs> that ribbon cable uh, has something to do with these address lines. How does that work? 
Well, it turns out the ribbon cable plugs into the socket right here. If I plug the ribbon cable into this socket, there's a bunch of pull-up resistors here that make these, uh, these are the eight data lines, right? Because we noticed on the other end, the ribbon cable has eight, eight uh, signals on it, uh, which have the uh, surprise, that's where the data, the data bits come from that, that are stolen from the uh, CPU over here. So uh, these pull-ups make all the eight data bits all into ones, unless somebody's driving them to a zero, okay? Now, the 8080 data bus does double duty. And this is right out of the design documentation uh, for the 8080 itself. I think I showed this once before when I suggested that we would find a relationship between the M1 signal and data uh, bit number five over here okay so this is the uh, user manual the data sheet for the 8080 itself from intel all right so it says uh, buy an 8212 connect it like this and this thing will capture the status bytes that are written out onto the data bus when it's not being used to transfer data to and from memory and io devices by the cpu okay so with the various data lines and the clock over here, it tells it exactly when the uh, information on the data bus is has this information on it. And these are all output status bits. And in here is your M1, your uh, out, and your in input uh, signals, like the ones from the Z80. This is your, your output signal, your input, your M1, your memory read. Uh, they also have a bit in here that says that the CPU is performing a memory transfer uh, involving the stack, which is actually kind of cool. I don't know if anyone ever used this. Uh, in theory, it shouldn't be a problem to use that as an additional address bit, allowing you to store your stack in a different bank of memory than everything else, which would allow the 8080 to have 128K of memory with half of it dedicated to be used for the stack. This might have been a, kind of a neat thing. I don't know. Did anybody do that? Beats me. There's a bit up here that has to do with interrupting knowledge. This is called write out, I believe. And um, they, I don't, some of these are weird. There's data bus in, then there's write out, memory read. Why do we have a separate in and a read? I don't know. Uh, I think the DB in by the way, to answer my own question, means that the data bus on the 8080, these drivers are configured to be inputting data regardless of what the reason is right now. You know, if it's doing an input an operation, that's not a memory read, okay? <laughs> that's an input operation, okay? Uh, so dbin may be true during memory read or input, okay? Or, or maybe even interrupting knowledge, right? Because it might uh, read in a byte during an interrupt acknowledge cycle. I don't remember uh, how all the interrupts really worked on 8080. I think it does have a, um, uh, it, it has like modes one and two, or mode zero and one of the Z80, uh, but not mode two of the uh, Z80. If we look in here, signals will be used to gate or restart instruction, yeah. So this, uh, the 8080 has two of the three modes that the Z80 supports, for example, all right? Anyway, my point is, this is where some of the bits of status and control output come from the 8080, and it, it uh, uses the data bus, uh, multiplexes that out of the data bus. Now, I said in one of my earlier videos that uh, I thought that the data bus was multiplexed with part of the address bus. It turns out <laughs> that with the 8080, that is a false statement, but... With an 8085, <laughs> that's a true statement. The 8085 uh, doesn't, uh, apparently they decided that it was not as useful to have these status bits multiplexed on the data bus, and instead they stored half the address bits on the data bus, and then they hardwired the rest of the, I, just FYI, uh, I got that mixed up. If you're getting it mixed up right now, yeah, I'm with you, <laughs> okay? So depending on which chip it is, they, they still multiplex the data bus, but uh, the 8080s multiplex it with these uh, status signals. So the point of this digression, all right, is that if some joker is hardwired the data bus bit here to ground, then it's not possible for M1 to ever become high. 
All right? So I'm thinking that at strategic moments, not necessarily always, because we do see the data bias fly. Sometimes it's on, sometimes it's stuck low, depending on what's going on. So there's the clue. There's a relationship between M1 and D5. So what does that have to do with these switches and what's going on over here? All right, now let's look in closely here. How do these switches get connected somehow to the address bus? How does that work? Okay. Well, as I said before, when I'm examining the uh, memory, where is that little table here? Oh, there it is. It turns out that these the, this little these notes that were provided by whoever redrew this schematic a couple of years ago pointed these things out. It says, look. Actually, I don't know if this is, I don't remember if this was on the original drawing or not, but it's certainly nice to have here, okay? What this s says, if you decode the rest of the schematic and figure out how the whole thing works, is that when this Q here, when EA1 here and EB1, it would have been nice if they would have labeled this thing in a reasonable, it just simply says U1800. <laughs> well, which of these pins are they talking about? They're talking about pins three and five, okay? When both of these Qs are zero, we're in state number zero over here, okay? The top row, okay? And that's not used. That's the idle state of our finite state machine. So the way this thing works is whenever we say examine... This state machine is going to cycle through these four states. It's idle when it's in state zero. It'll go to state one, two, three, and then it'll go back to state zero. So this is just a two-bit counter, all right? Now, what does it mean to be in these four states, all right? So the first one is when it's doing nothing. Second state, it says C3. Then it says lad and had. Well, what this is doing is in these three states here, when it is not idle, what happens is these various lines come up and around and control these gates. And these gates output down here these four different situations, okay? We'll ignore the one down here for a minute because I'm not talking about that one yet. We're worried about these switches here, okay? These are the three states plus the idle one, which has nothing to do with this down here. So these... Three signals here. This one, the C3, the, the LAD, and the HAD. You see them labeled right here, okay? What happens is those are driven. This is the, what comes out of the state machine, all right? These gates over here, when the state machine is idle, all three of these signals are zeros, or they're supposed to be. In state number one, this signal here goes high. And as the note up here says, it forces a C3 to be on the data bus. In effect, it causes a jump instruction. This is the opcode for the jump instruction when the examine function is executed. And that's what we're looking at right here. So what happens if I want to examine a byte of memory and that state machine cycles through setting this guy to a one with these on zero, then setting this one here to a one, and these up here being zero, and then this one here is set to a one with the other two being zero, okay? What is it doing? Well, when that's a one, and I've got zero, 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 zero on these lines, and these other four lines are not pulled to ground, with the ribbon cable running over to the CPU, there's pull-up resistors on the other side. It turns out <laughs> that in binary, I got one one zero 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 one one, which is a C three, which is the opcode of a brunch a jump instruction. If the next thing that goes on this data bus is timed correctly, and the CPU ingests that C three, then it comes back to ingest another byte, and this single here is high, and these other ones are low, then all these outputs are low. They're all pulled down unless these switches are up. So it lets me toggle in a binary value for the second of three bytes that are sent out on this bus in that order. Then the CPU can fetch this byte and use it as the first byte of the two-byte operand in little endian order of the jump instruction. Then it can come along here 
and read another byte, which can come from these switches. When the CPU then executes the jump instruction, it does an opcode fetch to read the byte of that instruction at that new address. When it reads that opcode, the address that is the target of the jump instruction is outputted on the address bus by the CPU. That's how those switches get put onto the address bus, <laughs> all right? It's like a four bank shot in a pool game, all right? Yes, you simply branch to whatever address you wanna see appear on these LEDs here. And when that is fetching that opcode to try and execute it, you then reassert this to stop the CPU. The CPU will be fetching that byte, that opcode of that target instruction, conceivably for days, unless you step it or, or let it run again. And as long as it's reading that one byte, the eight data bits will be presented to the data bus and held on there forever. Now these LEDs are not connected to the data bus. The question then is arise, well, how the heck do I get the, the S100 data onto these LEDs? Well, if you go back to the CPU, that's where, um, uh, that's the latch. This, that's where this part of the circuit comes into play. Let's take a closer look here. There's eight uh, uh, bits here and eight bits down here. Uh, the way this is drawing is a little confusing. There are, uh, what are these, two chips here? All right, that are kind of merged together into one. Uh, back in, you know, 1975, 1974, you didn't have the really fancy chips like we do today. This combined pair of chips represents a um, an 8-bit input buffer and an 8-bit driver all in one kind of setup here. All right, so these pull-up resistors here are on the S100 bus for the input data bits that flow into the CPU card, okay? These are the eight, eight data input lines. They have eight separate physical wires for the eight data output lines on the S100 bus, okay? And it has two, you know, one-way streets. It's a two-lane road, okay? All the output bits, DO0, DO1, DO2, DO3. They have their own dedicated pins. So your memory card will have something similar to this, right? So if if the memory card says, hey, you know, I, I wanna I wanna send data over because somebody's reading from me, it will write that data out on the memory card on pins 95 and 94 and 41 and 42 and so on, because they have to be sent from the memory card over to the CPU card where the CPU sees that as input. The memory sees it as output. If the CPU sends data to a memory card or an output device or something like that, it writes it out on the DO lines on pins 36, 35, 88, 89, and so on, okay? So it's got these two one-way streets here. And therefore, you need to build this uh, kind of a fork in the road here that's under control of this data input enable signal, right? And there's some notes down here. It says, oh, by the way, it'll go on if, if the uh, CPU needs to get data from the S100 bus and, and it uh, is a one, which means it goes off when the CPU wants to write data out to the S100 bus, okay? Which basically means that this two-way, uh, you know, this, 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 this bi-directional bus over here, whenever the CPU wants to send data out, this system here is configured that says, take whatever is on this bus here and copy it out to the data outlines over here. So it goes to where it's supposed to go. If anything, uh, if any time the CPU wants to read something from the S100 bus, it has to tell these guys to stop outputting, but turn on the input logic in here so that the, the input bits from the bus are what drives this bus here. And flow over here into this socket, over to the front panel to light up the LEDs. So what does that tell me? It tells me that 
if these pins are high and the Z and the 8080, I should say, is trying to read an opcode, which is the state we left off in, this system is configured to take the data from these pulled up signals and stick it on this bus. That's why we're seeing all the LEDs on on the other side of this cable. When this chip here is driving data in this direction. 8216. Well, this is a, a, a newer version of the same chip from National Semiconductor, right? Now, um, the key here, what I want to look up, see where it says load current is low, high drive capability, 50 milliamps, which is an enormous amount of current. Now, it doesn't really say which pins it drives at 50 milliamps. Is it these here? Is it these over there? Is it all of them? I don't know. And unfortunately, the sheet is not really super specific. I suspect, for reasons we'll see in a little while, that this drive capacity, which is enormous, by the way, uh, have a rated uh, drive capacity of 50 milliamps, is vastly more than what the CPU could ever do on a MOS chip like that, okay? Um, these are special drivers, okay? Uh, if we go down here, not only is its uh, normal drive capacity 50 milliamps, look what it says about the short circuit current on the drivers. It can go up to 120. <laughs> That's enormous, okay? Like even, you know, the TTL chips and, and you know, HCT drivers and stuff like that, those things, uh, I mean, we're in the single-digit milliamps, right? Two, three milliamps is not uncommon at all in modern, like, you know, FPGA output pins and stuff like that. So to have this much, it, it, it's like, wow, it's like a fire hose. That's a very strong device relative to what the 8080's drive capacity is going to be. I don't even need to look it up. It's going to be incredibly low. All right? Um, that's why we put driver chips on these things, by the way. So Otherwise, you know, in theory, they would have just hooked the data bus right up onto the S100 bus and just let it drive all those cards. I'm shocked that they did what they did here. The data bus is connected to all these pins here, all the pins here, through a one-foot-long <laughs> ribbon cable then runs over to the CPA, which could be connected to all these things here. If every one of these switches is down, which is the relaxed and normal case on almost all these things, when they're not being used, having all the switches down is very common. And even though these are disconnected, there's going to be some leakage current in here. This is a lot of junk to have hooked up to the CPU bus all at the same time, even when they're not doing anything, plus these drivers, plus this latch. That's crazy. Okay, um, I guess you <laughs> at, at really low data speeds, and uh, you know when you're dealing with the costs of uh, buying extra chips and stuff like that, this came out to be I guess tolerable. And most of these systems that are around still work, uh, except of course mine, or at least one of mine. Okay, so now we know in general the bird's eye view of what's going on here, and we know what's happening with this bus. We know there's something weird going on with data bit number five. What my theory is, something that's connected to data bit number five is not working, okay? And it's holding this thing low. But it's not holding it low so strongly as to prevent the drive capacity of the 8212 with its whopping 100 plus milliamp drive capacity from overpowering it. And these are exactly the kind of gates that could probably drive a couple of milliamp, maybe 10, maybe 20. But if somebody else comes in with a fire hose and goes, yo, no, I'm driving this thing, and I'm going to overpower you to death with my 100 milliamp death ray, this thing here will just say, I give up, right? It will just beat this thing to death and say, okay, <laughs> it's high in spite of what I'm trying to do, and it'll conflict. But the big driver will always win over the little driver, okay? So what does that mean to me? It means that if we look at U6 here, or, you know, we open all these switches, and these can't be driving anything. Well, we look at U1 down here, pin 2. Maybe one of these drivers is bad, 
and they're always pulling low, no matter what they're told. Now, we know that if, if this line here was always high, then all four of these would be low all the time. They'd all be causing this problem. Yet we only see weirdness on one bit, which is this bit right here, which is connected to this one gate right there. So I don't think this is broken. And I don't think that this is broken over here. This has to do with uh, next and advancing and going to the next instruction. But it works a lot like the ones above there. Once in a while, this will go one to in order to basically send this is the, the short of it is that when you say uh, examine, it's going to say jump and then give it two bytes of an address and three uh, bytes in a row here. OK, well, to say go to the next address. What it does is it just simply says put all binary zeros in here using the exact same technique. But it's not C3 blah, 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 blah for the two bytes. It's just all zeros. What happens when the CPU executes all zero? It's a no-op. What's the next instruction after a no-op? It's whatever is at the next address. Remember the clever thing about getting the address over to these LEDs over here, onto the address bus, right? All you need to do is make the Z or the 8080 want to fetch an instruction at the address I want to examine. Well, how do you examine the next one? You make it execute a no-op. So there's no counters in here anywhere that has to do with adding one to the address. <laughs> That's pretty darn clever. <laughs> Just make the actual CPU fetch something from the address that you want to see and hold it in that wait state once it's there. Okay? So why am I on about that right now? Well, if, uh, if this is uh, stuck at a 1, all four of these would be pulled down. If this was stuck at a 1, then all eight of these would be pulled down all the time. So I don't think that either one of these things is stuck. Okay? And it actually kind of works, provided I never want to put a one from the front panel on that data bit. Remember, any time this system is set to take the data from the input side of the bus and deliver it to the Z uh, to the eighty eighty, these massive drivers are going to overpower any output that would come from a 7405 over here. And I open up every one of these switches, and I execute the jump and then all ones and all ones, because everything is floating here. It doesn't end up at the address that's all ones. It doesn't go to FFFF, <laughs> right? A couple of those bits were zeros. So not all eight of these data bus lines are actually correctly pulled up by these resistors here. That could be one problem. It could be simple. Bad soldering. No pull up. Guess what? They'll never go high. Nothing else is pulling up on these lines. Wouldn't that be nice? Spoiler alert. It's not going to be that nice, but we'll look into that. The only other thing it is, in my opinion, if it's not one of those uh, pull up resistors not pulling up, is one of the gates that's on this bus that will not let it go. So I'm thinking pretty much like it's either going to be this pin right here on U6 pin 8, because that's going over here to the D5 line, or it's pin 2 on U1 right here. Those are the most likely culprits. That This open collector driver, the, the transistor that's pulling low is stuck on, on either U1 or U6. When the switch is up, it can't be these. Uh, yeah, a lesser likelihood would be that there's something wrong on the input stage on the circuitry uh, in U8 pin 9 here, or in the 8212. I've really got my fingers crossed that it's not the 8212, because these things are harder to come by. They're over 10 bucks a piece. I'd be more likely to just clip the pin and leave the uh, 8212 not working in this system rather than fix it uh, you know i don't know maybe i'll pick one up someday if i find a deal on one or maybe if somebody's got one to get rid of and they want to give me a deal on it yeah whatever maybe i'll get one find one at a ham fest someday or whatever don't know 
I'm going to just cross my fingers that it's not this one, okay? I got LSO4s and probably O5s lying around from the years gone by. Uh, I could easily pull out one of these chips and, and put a new one back in there. So, uh, the next question is, do I just blindly start unsoldering these chips till it goes away? Should I clip the lead off the pin and then what? Maybe solder a little jumper wire on it if it's okay. Uh, maybe I can get to the board traces. Maybe I should cut some board traces to sever these chips. Now, this is a mechanic problem. We're going to have to look at the board more closely. And, I mean, we might not have access to the traces. I don't know. But somehow, we're going to have to divide and conquer. So, tune in next time. We get out the X-Acto knives and do some surgery. As always, thanks for watching. I'll see you then.